Okay, well, uh, hello, everybody. Hello, good morning. Oh, cool. <laughs> We're here. Your response is better than my undergraduates. This is good. <laughs> I'm Steve Fazari here from St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, it's great to be back at the Levy Institute. I've been really here since the beginning in many ways. Uh, I remember when this building was just first renovated and, and we were coming here in the days when Hyminski was, was central to the Levy Institute. He was my colleague at WashU. I'll be, have, have more to say about that in a minute. Uh, but being back here is great, especially after the pandemic, uh, and I'm glad that everybody's here this morning. Uh, I have to move along, uh, as I will explain, so let me just jump right in. A few preliminaries. Uh, I'd like to share some remembrances to start with, because sadly, uh, three of my co-authors and close friends, Hyman Minsky most obviously, but also Tracy Mott and Piano Ferry just recently have passed away. And uh, th these are people all very meaningful for me uh, and important for, for this group in the broad sense. Uh, Minsky, of course, is in some ways the reason we're here and the, and the core of this lecture. Tracy was uh, a, a contributor to this seminar. The last time I saw Tracy was here at Bard College a few years ago. Uh, and Piero is maybe not as well known to you, but uh, was a close friend of High Minsky, uh, passed away about two weeks ago. Uh, my co-author on lots of, lots of things, a lot of the ideas that you'll be hearing about today are linked to Piero. And I do have on the slide uh, a, uh, a short uh, remembrance from Diana, High's uh, um, daughter, uh, who was a very close friend of Piero that I can, I can say just, well, I'll read it. Piero was High Minsky's closest and most beloved friend for the last quarter of Minsky's life. Their interest in economics stemmed from a desire to create an equitable society that provides a good quality of life for all. Piero improved the quality of life for all who had the pleasure of knowing him. He radiated joy. To honor Piero, I ask you, the next generation of heterodox economists, to acquaint yourself with his vast publications. Uh, so that's from Diana, High's daughter. Uh, I would also reflect Piero as kind of spreading joy and creativity and energy into the broader heterodox research community, and he's been very prolific even up until the last, uh, last months of his life. Uh, so uh, we rem remember him very fondly. Uh, next, just a bit on the history of this, this lecture. Uh, it's been going on for a while, I think for since the beginning. What is this, the 11th? Is that what we figured out? Nobody can really count, but <laughs> I think I've been here since the beginning of these seminars. And, uh, and traditionally, given the, the kind of structure of things, I did this in, in two sessions, which was about two and a half hours. And uh, so I'm knocking that down to about one and a little more <laughs> hours. Uh, uh, it, it is, one, one advantage is that, uh, is that Randy and, uh, and, and Yeva Narcissian uh, edited a book uh, and asked me to contribute a chapter, and I decided to basically write up uh, the contributions that I've been giving to this seminar over the years. So it's there, it's posted on the, on the website. Uh, there will be some redundancy between what you hear me say today and what's in that chapter, but some of the details that we'll lose from con compressing this down are certainly covered in that reading. and. and um, so you have that available to you. Uh, in terms of some deletions uh, that uh, I'm, I'm not going to do as much on the Minsky investment model. Again, it's in the chapter and, uh, and the paper by Randy and Eric uh, that, that is on for the next session also is very helpful here. Some of the comparisons with the mainstream, uh, I'm not going to work on so much today, although you have heard some nice uh, comments from Pavlina in the earlier sessions. And we'll see how, how much time we have for details on inequality and secular stagnation at the end. But again, all that is in the book chapter. So let me just jump right in. Uh, basically two parts of the story. The first is more directly Minsky, and the official title of this on the, on the program is Intro to Minsky. I think it's a little uh, presumptuous. There's some specific ideas about Minsky that I'll be talking about. But the, the first part links to Minsky's theory of the firm and how that leads into financial instability. Uh, the second part is applying Minsky to recent US experience, but not so recent in the sense of just pandemic or the last few years, but, but over the last several decades. Uh, in particular, the linkage to consumption, the Great Recession, uh, and then how inequality played a role in those dynamics, and ultimately, if we have time, a little bit of com a conversation about secular stagnation. There's interesting things to say about the pandemic, but you're hearing things there. I'll, I'll, we can maybe get to that in Q&A if we like. One thing I've noticed, and I was attending most of the sessions yesterday remotely, and uh, uh, that that, uh, the discussion's been really good. Uh, and so I hope to have time afterwards and to get your feedback and, and questions because uh, I think it's really been quite effective. Okay, uh, so let me start out with Minsky and 
uh, what is called here micro behavior in a sense. Uh, although given the condensed nature of this slide is both micro and macro. So, so Minsky interpreted Keynes, uh, you've probably heard about this, as Keynes proposing an investment driven theory of output. And then Minsky comes in and says, I'm going to build on that and create a financial theory of investment, linking finance to, to investment. But this ties to the micro idea, which is the locus of activity is the firm. So very different than the mainstream beginning of general equilibrium theory when you start with what, what Minsky called a village fair economy with no production, just exchange. Here, the focus is on, from the beginning, the, the active uh, agent in the economy is the business firm. And it, it's active in a, in a kind of interesting sense. Uh, you see the phrase there that the firm is more than just a repository of technology. And if you think about the firm in, in mainstream theory, you've got the production function and basically it's, the firm is just transforming inputs into outputs largely. Uh, profit maximization, has got a bit of behavior there, but, but for the most part, uh, behavior is pretty limited in mainstream view of the firm. But that's not so in, in Minsky, uh, where the firm's investment decisions become the engine of the model and the particular focus in Minsky's work is that investment has to be financed and this leads to this intrinsic duality between the real uh, productive part of investment, the technology in a sense, and the financial side of investment. And he, his, Minsky's argument was you could not separate those together. So there's this emphasis on production, again, in comparison to just the exchange economies. It's also the case that while you have the firm is making the investment decisions, the banks, or more broadly the financial system, is there as, and the, and the behavior of those banks is central to the Minsky view. Uh, we were talking last night about how uh, in the years I knew high back at, uh, at Washington University, I would go into his office and what he would usually be doing is, is kind of deep, would be deeply into the middle of the Wall Street Journal. You know, if you read the front page and the op-ed pages and things like that, then, then you're like me. Minsky was in section B, you know, page six or seven or eight, where there's all this detail of what's going on in the financial system. He was very, very focused on uh, the, the mechanics, the details, the behaviors of modern finance. So Minsky, uh, quote, these, these page numbers you see here all from stabilizing an unstable economy. A decision to invest is always a decision about a liability structure. Finance is always crucial. Uh, one sense in which this is particularly important and it, it motivated a lot of my work over my career is the distinction between investment finance with internal funds, with internal cash flow versus access to external funds, either uh, mostly in Minsky, more about borrowing, but you could extend this to, uh, to equity finance as well, external equity finance as well. Uh, he talked about two sides of the financial uh, determinants of investment. One is the borrower's risk, which is largely subjective. It's in the minds or the, or the behaviors of the business firm, uh, a firm operating in a world of uncertainty uh, where uh, there was a desire to have a margin of safety to, you never knew for sure if the cash flows your investment would, uh, would create would be adequate to service the liability structure that the firm created to finance the investment, but you would try to have a margin of safety in your plans. Uh, there was the Koleski theory of increasing risk that as, as investment expands, the risk from the point of view of the firm rises. I, I cite Tracy here who, who, who wrote extensively on this topic going back to his dissertation. Uh, the idea about controlling assets, that is, uh, the business firm is trying to control its activity. It doesn't want to be, uh, uh, beholden to the out, to outsiders and making its uh, making its decisions and, is, and and being able to access funds in the future. So there's this kind of sense of risk uh, from the point of view of the firm, uh, given the possibility of, of loss of control. Uh, and this is a kind of active entrepreneurial perception. Uh, perception. You're not going to see this directly in, in market prices. Uh, a complementary story here, which has influenced me over my uh, career, is, is Jim Crotty's work on, on corporate control and this idea of controlling the firm and, and the, kind of ma the behavior of managers and, and, and entrepreneurs as such that they want to keep control of their activities. Uh, and as such, there, there's this additional risk as you, as you extend investment and require especially external finance.
On the supply side uh, for investment, you have what we call lender's risk, and this is more objective. You actually see this in contracts, you would see it in interest rates, you would see it in the kinds of prices that you can actually observe. But again, this idea of uncertainty and margins of safety apply from the lender's point of view as well. They want to make sure they get repaid. And so there's going to be, especially as investment expands, uh, a greater concern about uh, uh, making sure that, that, uh, that things are not too aggressive, that, that there's a high probability of repayment. You see this in debt covenants and, and, and uh, contractual arrangements that constrain what the, what the firm can do. Uh, and this is related to the idea of credit crunches, credit freezes, more of a macroeconomic con uh, concept about how uh, credit, uh, the, the supply of credit is, is rising and falling and, and evolving over time. Uh, so you have the demand side, borrower's risk, the supply side, uh, Lenders risk, this gets uh, put into a diagram, again, in, in the more detailed version of this in the book chapter, and also it shows up in, in some of the other things you've seen. You see the Minsky diagram about these, uh, how these things come together to determine business investment. Uh, now, so, so this is a microeconomic analysis of investment. Uh, but I want to make this distinction uh, between micro and macro uh, that I think is really important. So finance drives investment to a large extent in the Minsky view. It's not that other things don't matter, but, but finance is central to any understanding of investment from the point of view of Minsky, uh, which could lead you to think, well, that, does that mean then, therefore, that aggregate investment is somehow constrained by the amount of finance or that, broadly speaking, the amount of scarce saving in the, uh, in the economy? And that's, that's wrong. <laughs> Uh, that's not the case. So there's this micro versus macro distinction. Uh, the, the, there is no macroeconomic constraint, and here you've heard about this already. Uh, so you've heard criticisms of the loanable funds theory, this idea that somehow aggregate saving is driving the amount of investment that, that takes place. That's, you know, that, Minsky is a Keynesian. The Minsky perspective would be one where if there is in investment actually undertaken that will generate the income and ultimately the saving uh, to offset this. So investment drives saving in this perspective. But finance drives investment. So the, the issue here is that it's the financial system, it's the access to financing at the micro level that will determine investment and then that leads into the macro determination of saving ultimately. So uh, these constraints are imposed by micro level decisions to finance capital expenditure by borrowers and lenders and then uh, and then you go from there and say well where does the money come from? This is basically the endogenous money approach. So if the financial system broadly conceived decides to finance investment, they will find the funds endogenously uh, to fund that, and then that will generate uh, aggregate savings. So there's this kind of fundamental micro-macro inter interaction that's important to understand and not to get somehow conflate the Minsky linkage between investment and finance to some kind of a loanable funds theory. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the evidence. It's been a big part of my research program over the last uh, decades. Uh, so uh, I've run how many thousands of regressions of investment on cash flow uh, to, uh, to look for financial effects uh, on investment. Uh, this is a little bit of an econometric challenge. There's an identification issue here. Basically, cash flow is driven by profits. And so nobody's going to be too surprised to find a positive correlation between uh, cash flow and and investment in a, in a very simple sense. So the idea is in some sense to control for uh, investment demand or at least conventional technologies, investment demand, productivity of capital, accelerator effects, all these kinds of things. And then to see once you control for those factors, do you find an impact of cash flow on investment? The idea that uh, when firms have more access to internal funds, other things equal, they would invest more. And heterogeneity has been a, was a huge part of this idea, the idea of looking at different kinds of firms, smaller firms, firms without bond ratings, firms that don't pay dividends, uh, that, that are more likely to face financial constraints and to see that the cash flow effects on investment are stronger in that kind of firm. And that's become a huge literature. It's actually quite a mainstream literature. I would say it's actually changed the way main, the mainstream thinks. When I started on this business, uh, well, actually I was working on this kind of thing with Tracy Mott back in graduate school in the, around 1980, but uh, certainly through the 1980s, the mainstream idea was that uh, finance was largely irrelevant for investment. Minsky was very much a backwater. And now that's actually not true. And now even in new classical models, you see cash and advance constraints and things like this, which all tie to the idea that there actually is a link between um, between fi financial conditions and, and business investment. Again, I was going to stay away from some of the more, uh, more mainstream discussion, but I couldn't help myself there. Um, 
In addition, Minsky emphasized the link between debt and, and business investment and the idea in particular of rising borrower's risk, rising lender's risk um, as more debt is taken on. Uh, and, and this has not been studied as much. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's some nice work though on, on leverage and, and how it affects uh, micro level investment. My student who's now at, at UMass, Leon, that's spelled wrong actually, <laughs> Leon Sindukumana, uh, there's no uh, I in his first name, uh, has a nice paper in the JPK, JPKE uh, based on his dissertation that studied this issue. There's recent work by Layla Davis, uh, Davis on this topic that's quite nice. Uh, so again, finding effects of debt and leverage on, uh, on um, business investment, or in particular, higher interest commitments leading to lower investment. Again, kind of a difficult identification problem, but I don't want to get too bogged down in that issue. And then there's the credit channel uh, literature in, in more of a macroeconomic literature, somewhat more mainstream. Uh, Pavlina was talking about Ben Bernanke earlier today, uh, Mark Gertler, among many others, that find financial conditions, monetary policy affecting business investment, broadly consistent with the Minsky micro theory uh, and, and its macro implications. So again, this is really brief. Uh, summary of, of Minsky's theory of investment. Uh, what I want to really focus on now is how you go from micro to macro, how you go from this investment driven, uh, finance driven investment theory of the firm to macroeconomic dynamics and the dynamics of financial instability. So the context here is what I've been calling in, in recent years uh, a dynamic demand generating process. Uh, and you see my, my phrase up there in the context of an intrinsic Keynesian model. The, the idea of an intrinsic Keynesian model is linked to some things Pavlina was saying at the first session this morning that demand, the, the Availability of demand is not in any sense automatic over any horizon. So this is rejecting the neoclassical synthesis or, uh, whereby wage and price flexibility means that uh, Keynesian results only apply in the short run of nominal rigidities and in the long run we converge to some supply driven path. Or the new consensus model which is more along the lines of we don't know if price, wage and price flexibility really will do the job but somehow markets don't immediately clear. There is some rigidities out there and what gets us to uh, supply driven so called full employment path is, is wise monetary policy. Uh, so. We're re rejecting that perspective, and, and, and you know, for years of my teaching, I would get, come to the point of saying that there really is no kind of automatic or even uh, super effective policy as, as conventionally uh, conceived that will get the economy onto this long run supply driven growth path along the lines of say a, a solo growth model. Um, and, and so what we have to do to understand macroeconomic dynamics over in the short run, medium run, long run, is to understand what is, what's driving uh, the demand process through time. And uh, I think this is where Minsky comes in. I think the Minsky has a, a theory of how demand evolves through time linked to uh, the basic uh, ideas about, uh, about how the financial sector and businesses behave. So uh, this complements uh, other things I've been working on, especially recently, the more abstract Koleskian growth model or super multiplier models, which actually in some ways go back to Herod, where we're studying these things more analytically. Uh, I, the Minsky model is in some sense richer, more historical, and certainly integrates finance. And people have been integrating finance into those other models as well, but I think Minsky is, has got a unique perspective on, on this whole demand generating process. And basically, the, the idea is this financial instability hypothesis that there's this endogenous uh, transition from a stable, fairly robust financial structure to financial fragility, which will ultimately lead to uh, macroeconomic crisis. So I'm going to talk about two, two key words here, which are critical to my understanding of Minsky. One is validation, the other is fragility. So let's, this is a validation slide uh, where I say Minsky is in fact a Keynesian. <laughs> so uh, he, he, uh, he has basic demand-driven um, ideas about what, you know, what's determining output, employment, incomes, cash flows, profits at any point in time. So the typical way of describing this is to begin with what we might think of as a more conservative financial structure. It could be after a crisis when a lot of the more fragile, uh, tenuous financial positions have been wiped out. Things are, are maybe kind of boring, but fairly stable. And I like to think of this as, as, as 
businesses, banks, finances, <laughs> the financial system broadly is kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Trying, when things are going you know, reasonably well, there's not a lot of financial instability, somebody says, let's, let's take a more aggressive position. Let's do something a little bit, maybe what looks like a little bit more risky, which would then finance new activity, leading to more spending, which would then create more income, which validates the more aggressive position. So there's kind of positive feedback loop here, which is very Keynesian with uh, a decision to finance uh, investment leading to economic stimulus that creates more uh, cash flows and profits that validate that those more aggressive positions. Uh, this idea from Koleski that investment generates profits is something Minsky adopted later in his career. It's also the case that when things are going reasonably well, these more aggressive positions, a stronger economy, asset prices rise, collateral is more available. Uh, and, and so you kind of get this virtuous positive feedback circle working, which leads to more optimism. And the idea here is the proximate constraint and output is demand. So when more activity is financed, cash flows are going to rise and just kind of keep the process going. Uh, it's one where supply constraints are rare. And of course, I added to the slide here, pandemic issues notwithstanding. Uh, so this is a very special time with where I think there are some real supply constraints, but I think it's very unusual. If I look back to US economic history since uh, you know, World War II, there were supply constraints, maybe a bit in the, in the 1960s. Maybe the late 1990s, there was a pretty booming economy, but even then I still think the proximate constraint on output was demand, that if there had been more demand, there would be at the margin more output created. So this is, this in general, in a kind of medium to long run sense, you get this validation process whereby the more aggressive finan uh, financial practices lead to more investment, more stimulus, demand stimulus, you're getting more output, more income that validates those, those um, it was more aggressive position. So this process can continue for years. It's not just a short run process. And of course, this contrasts with the kind of mainstream view where these Keynesian, th these Keynesian uh, issues are constrained to just a, a, a few quarters. Uh, and also this notion here that the fundamental direction of instability is upward. Uh, Minsky usually gets uh, quoted in the, in the press when there is some kind of a financial crisis, and appropriately so. But in some ways, I think the, this upward direction, this validation process, is, uh, is maybe the core of, of the Minsky ideas. But what happens, and this is the other side of the, of the coin, is, the, is rising financial fragility. So this validation positive feedback loop it leads to more aggressive and more risky financial practices and that systematically increases financial fragility sometimes i describe this as the ticking time bomb that's going on so how do you see this well as you see more external finance you see debt ratios rising you see shifts from longer term financing to shorter term financing and here the hedge speculative ponzi uh, characterization that's that's so often associated with Minsky's work comes into play uh, that you need to roll over those short-term financing of longer uh, of longer lived assets as you get more aggressive financing and that becomes more risky you have a shift from financing based on cash flow to financing based on on uh, collateral and asset prices one of the things I remember learning from Hi Minsky back in the days when we were together at Washington University was that a good loan is a loan based on on cash flow Ca collateral is a backup uh, foreclosure is, is something you don't want to do, uh, so that uh, uh, cash flows were the, were the basis for uh, good, uh, solid banking practices. Uh, and, but as you saw, and what we saw in the, up, uh, the lead up to the Great Recession on the, in the U.S. housing market, is more and more uh, of financing based on asset prices and collateral rather than good cash flows. Then there's this institutional change that leads to more fragility, that you have various kinds of financial in innovations to facilitate credit expansion, things like securitization come to mind. I'll say a few things in more detail in a few minutes. Uh, and also, uh, the Minsky's view that the financial system would, would circ circumvent regulation. So the, the extent to which you have prudential regulation trying to constrain more risky financial practices, uh, the, the system is gonna try to evolve around those things, especially as they're optimistic, as validation is proceeding, they're aggressive. We don't need to worry about that, or we can, we can, we can have uh, 
what would <laughs> next post became more risky positions because everything looks good right now. Um, so again, the fundamental direction of instability is upward. And again, I quote from high, success breeds a disregard for the possibility of failure. So that you're getting these greater and greater, this more and more fragile financial structure, which is validating through higher, higher cash flows, but becoming more risky. Uh, so a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago now, I was teaching uh, my upper level uh, undergraduate macro seminar and I think I was in a chemistry room or something like that. So I was thinking about natural sciences and how they do experimental work. And I thought about a stress test uh, as a metaphor for the linkage between validation and fragility. So the idea here is, you know, you're thinking about testing the, the, the strength of a piece of metal. So you put it on your lab bench and you put some weight on each side. And if it doesn't break, that's validation. It's strong. It's, it's not breaking. What do you do? You put more weight on it. Uh, you increase the fragility of the system. It doesn't break. You put, on, you put even more weight in, and you're going to keep putting more weight on both sides of the piece of metal until the blasted thing breaks. I think I had a student years who also talked about the game Jenga, where you pull out the little blocks as you, as you go along. Oh, it doesn't fall down. It's validated. Pull out another block. It becomes more fragile. You know, so you have this sense of the logic of the system is it has to, it must eventually break. Otherwise, you're going to add more stress. And in the context of the, of the financial system, it's that someone is going to be making money if the system doesn't break, and that's going to encourage them to become even more aggressive. So. You just keep going. Fr fragility <laughs> keeps rising until uh, until you get to the uh, the breaking point, and, and you can see the you know the famous characterization of Minsky: stability is destabilizing. Validation leads to more fragility, which ultimately will be destabilizing and lead to crisis. So this is to me the the this kind of dance of validation and fragility uh, that that takes place dynamically is the core of the basic Minsky framework. So uh, that's a, a quick part, I'm just checking my time here, not doing too badly, uh, a quick survey of, the, of what had been the first lecture in this, in this uh, dual lecture series, and so let me move to the second one, which is say, okay, you have this basic framework. Validation fragility, how does this play out? How does this play out in generating the great recession, the dynamics that led to the great recession in the US first off and then spreading to the world in the global financial crisis? This was a very significant financial crisis, uh, I think the most significant since the 1930s. Uh, it's clear in the US context that household debt, consumer spending played a huge role. And I want to argue that this does fit the broad outlines of the Minsky dynamics and that the, the financial practices were the source of instability. So this is a, a, a historical application of the, uh, of the financial instability theory of Hyman Minsky. Uh, but I have to talk a little bit about some, some changes. One is investment or consumption. So if you read Minsky, you'll see that he talks almost exclusively about businesses, about investment, in some ways very consistent with Keynes about the idea, again, Keynes, according to Minsky, investment theory of output, Minsky, a finance theory of investment. He, he does recognize household debt uh, in a stabilized and unstable economy. He, he has this quote that uh, household uh, finance is fairly well known and relatively stable in contrast with investment, behavior of consumption is secondary. So, you know, consumption kind of sits in the background uh, of the Minsky uh, discussion in his own writings. And I think it's interesting to think about why. Unfortunately, I never really had a chance to talk to Hyman about this, but uh, the se my sense is that U.S. consumption in his formative years was pretty stable. It was reasonably strong. It was based primarily on wage or income growth. There was limited household finance. People borrowed you know, for, for, for more, they have mortgages, borrowed to buy a house, but with large down payments, there might have been some, some of the things going on in, in automobiles and, and, and other large consumer durables. But for the most part, there's a pretty limited uh, role for financial instability in the household sector in the U.S., the 1950s, the 1960s, into the 1970s. And the locus of financial instability, the kinds of things I talked about, uh, were mostly in the business sector, energy lending and the lending against farms, uh, uh, commercial paper, uh, he, 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 he discussed these various historical events of those decades regularly, but they were all linked to business finance. Uh, but my premise is that Minsky's theory provides a, a powerful uh, framework for understanding what uh, I've called in some of my work the consumer age, this, this period of increasing household sector financial fragility that ultimately sowed the seeds of the Great Recession crisis. And I think Randy may, may be talking more in the uh, session after lunch about 
Hominsky did actually see this coming later on. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he did identify issues about securitization of mortgage markets and these kinds of things and was prescient in that sense. I, I fully believe that had he lived into the, you know, into the century that he would have, uh, he would have seen this coming uh, in, in many ways before almost anyone else. Uh, so uh, let me talk a little bit about this period and then provide some evidence and, and, uh, and link these ideas together. So what is this consumer age? Well, it was a strong, period of household uh, of U.S. household demand. Um, in fact, I would argue that this great moderation interpretation of U.S. macro experience from the middle 1980s up until the Great Recession around 2006 or 2007 was to a large extent, or may, maybe to the greatest extent, the result of relatively strong and stable uh, rising household demand. Uh, and this provided a kind of validation. So you actually had the emergence of this idea of the great moderation. You had the emergence of the new consensus macro, which is we've kind of figured out monetary policy, we can keep the economy on a stable path with just you know, wise people running the Federal Reserve. But it was also associated, and this was missed by the mainstream, with a dramatic rise in the financial fragility of the household sector that eventually caused the Great Recession. So here's a little bit of data. Can you see that? Okay, yeah, it looks all right up there. Uh, so uh, let me just talk a little bit about measurement. Uh, again, I can't help myself. This would have been a slide in the previous discussion. Um, so this is what we call uh, household demand, what I have in the parentheses there, ca uh, cash flow measure divided by real disposable income. So it's not quite consumption over income because I've been doing work with my longtime co-author Barry Cinnamon, former student, um, about measurement. You know, I, if you look at the, at the national accounts in, in almost any country, there's all sorts of stuff in personal consumption that actually isn't personal. It's not household demand in my view. For example, if you get uh, government finance health care, that, that comes through, uh, that comes through as, as personal consumption. Uh, I own my own home, so according to the government, I'm renting my house to myself, and that counts as, uh, that counts as personal consumption. There's no cash flow involved in that. Uh, so Barry and I have done some things to, um, to adjust, to actually measure the spending coming out of the household sector that's actually creating cash demand in the, in the economy. And a lot of the data that we talk about here, well, I'll also, I actually will show you a few comparisons. I don't have it on this chart. Uh, but we did update some of this stuff. So these, these are new, new charts, and, and uh, the ones in the, in the book chapter, I think, end in about 2014 or 2015. So, um, so what do you see here is, I'm going to use my cursor. You can see it there. Yeah, good. Uh, is is a period of rising household demand relative to income. In a way, I, I should mention uh, Josh Mason and Arjun Jayadev's work there. They were somewhat critical of that view. They don't really see it so much as, as rising demand. It's a bit in the eye of the beholder. You know, you have, the, you have this, uh, let's see, I'm not doing very well with my pointer. There we go. You have this low point uh, in the early 80s. Uh, with a very tight monetary policy. You have this really high level here towards the end. A lot of this is because of the way we treat housing and, and real estate, uh, which I won't go into in detail. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, it looks like an upward trend there, but if you take some of those peaks out, you could say it's just volatility. There's a bit of debate. If you look at the standard uh, national income account measures, it, which is more stable for various reasons, it's clearly an upward trend. What is unambiguous, though, is, that, is, is the drop is that when we hit the Great Recession, and this is, this is I believe, 2006, so it's actually, this was starting to fall even before the, the worst part of the Great Recession, uh, but it, there's this massive drop, uh, and then it stays at a much lower level in the period of so-called secular stagnation after the Great Recession, and I put on COVID here, for, in case you're interested. It was, a, this is 2020. It was, a, of course, a, a dramatic drop, and it's come back since then. We haven't, it's, complicated and we have to get a lot of data that, to come out with a long leg to do these calculations. Uh, so we don't have it past 2020 at this point, but uh, I'm sure it's, it's bounced back significantly. So this is this idea that you've got strong spending from the household sector that is, is fueling the economy and, and pushing things forward for a, you know, at least a two decade process from the middle 1980s until the middle of the early part of the, of the 2000s. Uh, here is maybe a more direct uh, link to the Minskian idea. So this is, this is the financial fragility point. This is household debt to disposable income. And here I am showing you the two different measures. So uh, the solid line is our adjusted measure, which is primarily looking at income. Uh, the, the reason that there, there's something on the debt side, but the main reason that, that our, our adjusted measure is higher than the dotted line, which is the conventional measure, uh, is because we re redefine income. And again, if you're getting uh, Medicare or Medicaid from the government, you can't use that to pay your you know, mortgage. Uh, that, uh, 
that the de definitions of income in the national accounts are are, are kind of misleading, I think, for, uh, for looking at, at some of these Minsky dynamics. But it really doesn't matter too much. The adjustments matter quantitatively, quite significantly by the end, in terms of how high this ratio goes. But the basic dynamics are the same, whether you use the standard or the adjusted measures. You see this period of the 1960s, the flat arrow there, where uh, after the in, immediate post-war period, the debt to income ratio rose as my parents' generation bought houses uh, and, and took out mortgages. But then it stabilized in the 1960s and the 1970s. But beginning, depending on how you want to look at it, in the mid to late 70s, or it's certainly by the middle 1980s, you have a pretty significant rise in this ratio. And then it really, it really takes off like crazy crazy in the late 1990s and that last gasp of the of the uh, of the massive uh, housing bubble period uh, so this is this is rising fragility in the Minsky in sense and again you see what happens after the crisis there's a short period where it kind of tops off and then it plummets as you have defaults uh, and and uh, businesses of uh, banks much much less willing to uh, extend uh, especially housing credit and other kinds of things. Uh, here's another measure. Uh, this is the saving rate, uh, various measures of the saving rate. The dotted line on top is the standard personal saving rate. And again, you can see it jumping up. I put the pandemic in here uh, for, kind of for, for reference, even though I'm not going to have time to talk much about that. But what you generally see here is, uh, and then these other two measures are two, two from our adjusted one. This middle one is what we call gross, uh, the gross saving rate. That includes uh, housing, the new, new houses that are, that are constructed, but you kind of think of that in some ways as consumption. You're building these houses, uh, you know, you're, it, it's pretty much like consumption. The bottom, the bottom line here is what we call the financial saving rate. This is what you might think of more traditionally as people actually uh, accruing, uh, household sector actually accruing financial assets. That goes strongly negative. But again, you see all these, all three of these series are, are moving, not identically, but in the same general direction of a declining saving rate from the middle 1970s up until right before or right as the Great Recession takes place, and then you see this, this big spike upwards. Uh, so all measures of, of rising financial fragility. So the main message here is that these household spending dynamics were critical to what was initially the Great Moderation then became the Great Recession, that there was an endogenous process of evolution whereby the, the, the relatively strong and stable U.S. economic performance from the middle 1980s to roughly 2006 was validating uh, and was encouraging more aggressive finance to the household sector, but you got this rise in fragility uh, that, was, was, uh, that was eventually going to bring this, this uh, long swing to an end. So it's the Minsky story applied to the household sector. Uh, so let me talk about this in a little bit more detail. On the borrower's risk side, you had institutional change, uh, that there was tax reform that encouraged home equity loans, uh, that made it much easier to tap uh, the equity in houses to finance uh, other kinds of spending, which it, it, it changed the perspective on borrowing against home equity. So I suppose when I first got my, more, my first mortgage in late 1982, uh, if I wanted to refinance that, that was kind of a process I had to go through. If I wanted to extract equity, I would have to you know, do a lot of, go through a lot of uh, transactions, uh, costly in, in various ways to do this. But you know, by now, and this was moving, changing already in the, in the mid to late 1980s, uh, because of some tax reforms, it became possible to first write a check against the equity in your house with a home equity credit line. And now you can just do it with a few clicks. If you wanted to talk about it during a break or lunch, I can tell you the story of my current, uh, my current home equity line of credit, which is pretty interesting in terms of how I could probably generate uh, $200,000 of cash as we stand here. <laughs> uh, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, so it became much easier to access home equity. Uh, maybe, uh, probably, you know, at least as important. Uh, we're falling interest rates uh, and the habit of refinancing. In some sense, it was kind of a, <laughs> It was an interesting historical period. So, you know, we've talked a fair amount about inflation here with the pandemic issues. So, of course, there was there was big inflation in the U.S. in the late 19, mid to late 1970s into the early 1980s. Nominal interest rates go, you know, go sky high. My first mortgage uh, interest rate was 12 percent, and I felt lucky to get it because it was down from 16 percent just a few months earlier. And uh, of course, what was happening after that was uh, a long trend to falling nominal interest rates. Well, what does that mean? And that went on for. Uh, 
at least 20 years. Uh, of course, if you had a 12% mortgage and interest rates are 9% or 8%, you're going to want to refinance. And then if you're 8% and interest rates fall to 7% or 6 or 5, you're going to want to refinance. So there was this period of falling interest rates and the perfectly rational, logical habit of refinancing. And it was, you know, real interest rates are another issue, but just, this would be generated by a fall in nominal rates. Uh, but of course, you know, you could take out when you refinance, you could, could extract equity much more easily. Uh, and so you might be ha you know, having conversation with the banker, well, yes, yeah, so it makes sense for you to refinance, interest rates are 200 basis points lower, uh, but you're making your monthly payments, so instead of uh, just lowering the principal, why don't you walk away with a check for $25,000 and just keep doing the same thing? So, you, you know, people were, it became uh, much easier uh, behaviorally and, and there was an encouragement to, to, to pull equity out of the home. Uh, and you also had this, this changing convention, a shift of, of norms of using, uh, of kind of borrowing against the house. My, my parents would never have done it. You know, I could put my kids through college with home equity loans. Uh, uh, and it was fine, but uh, it just a, a shift, maybe also linked to credit cards and other kinds of things. And uh, you, what you see here is a sort of social context. The, one of the first papers Cinnamon and I wrote on this topic was really emphasizing the way in which people's behaviors were shifting and becoming more uh, comfortable with credit. And this was, you know, this was a 20, 25 year process, right? The, for, uh, you know, so I'm 66 years old up until the time, so, you know, I guess I have to re re rewind here to uh, where is it, 2022 and 2010. Uh, I, uh, you know, so, so from the time uh, I started my job, uh, my first professional job in my mid-20s up until I was in my 50s. This, that, that whole period of time was a period of greater and greater access to, uh, to home equity lending. And so this, this is the only, the only, for many people, the only situation uh, that, they, that they knew about. And it was uh, becoming more and more common uh, socially to be taking on, taking on debt. So this, this is the you know, validation rising fragility. It worked. You, know, you, got a lower, you got a lower interest rate. You were able to pull cash out. Uh, if things got a little bit tight, you were able to, um, you, you know, you're able, able to work it out in this period of, uh, falling interest rates and greater access to credit. On the lender's risk side, in some ways this was even a bigger deal. Uh, you know, you have financial innovation breeding fragility. You had credit scoring technology. I think that dates back to the 19, late 1970s, uh, and which, which made household lending much more of a commodity rather than something that was a personal relationship between the banker and the, and the borrower. Uh, and that again was validated by the great moderation, the, the strength of the economy in the 1990s with the technology bubble and a variety of other things that kept making it look you know, better and better from the, from the lender's point of view, from the financial system point of view of pushing more and more credit out uh, to the household sector. Uh, modern finance assisted this perspective. There was this false perception of risk management that with the new financial innovations that were coming out, especially with securitization and the chopping up of, of, uh, of mortgage-backed securities into these different tranches, that, that risk was being allocated efficiently uh, according to mainstream finance theory and that uh, as a result, we could have a more aggressive uh, household lending sector. And again, this uh, success breeds a disregard to the possibility of failure. I'm gonna read this rather long quote here because the dance of validation and fragility again is, is uh, I think this is the, you know, what, the best quote I've ever seen on this from somebody named Boykin Curry. Who I think some of the people around here over the years that actually knew this person, the managing director of Eagle Capital. This is a quote from 2008 in a Newsweek article. For 20 years, the DNA of nearly every financial institution had morphed dangerously. Each time someone at the table pressed for more leverage and more risk, the next few years proved them right. Validation. <laughs> These, people's, these people were emboldened, they were promoted, and they gained control over ever more capital. Meanwhile, anyone in power who hesitated to argue for caution was proved wrong. The cautious types were increasingly intimidated, passed over for promotion. They lost their hold on capital. This happened every day in almost every financial institution over and over until we ended up with a very specific kind of person running things. Fragility, you know, so you get, it's working, we're making money. Uh, uh, many of you have probably seen The Big Short, the movie, or read the book. Uh, I, for, for a lot of reasons, I thought the... Yeah. <laughs> 
I thought the movie wasn't very good, but then I kept talking about it. Uh, and <laughs> so I guess maybe there was something there. But uh, what I remember is this idea of, of, one, of the, one of the people who was trying to bet against the housing market coming to, I think it's Goldman Sachs, uh, or one of the big financial firms, going into the room and asking for uh, some kind of a, a financial instrument that lets them short the housing market. And, uh, and people are kind of chuckling at this person, you know, kind of, <laughs> well, you know, we, well, let's take advantage of this sucker. <laughs> was basically the story. And, and uh, uh, I think the initial, like the lower level people were saying, well, maybe we could provide you, you know, uh, I, I can't remember the number, $100 million. And, uh, and, and the person back says, no, I want, you know, $2 billion. And, and, uh, and, and the, the boss comes in and says, give them $2 billion. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the, these people are out of the mainstream. They, they, they're, they're missing the point. Uh, I remember a, more, more academically a, a paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that came out probably around 2006 or 2007 saying the housing market is fine. <laughs> Don't worry, you know, asset prices are higher. Greenspan, in the early 2000s, when, uh, oh, now the name is escaping me, the, the person's passed away, the governor came, came to him and said, I'm worried about the housing market. Greenspan said, don't worry, the asset prices are, the housing prices are high, so all this extra debt is gonna be fine, uh, in, in some respects. Uh, so, this was a very, the mainstream way of thinking, not so much mainstream in terms of neoclassical macroeconomics, but mainstream in terms of, the way the financial markets were perceiving this was really very much tied into the validation success and, and, and in huge amounts of money made in this, uh, in this upswing period. Again, the fundamental direction of instability is upward. Um, so that's the Curry thing. Uh, let's see, I, I, so I'll skip the, oh, well, yeah, the, yeah, I'll skip the hubris and, and bullish convention point. And my double star there says we probably shouldn't take time on that. But basically, you have the great, the great moderation uh, is this period of sowing the seeds of its own destruction, uh, of creating this process be because of this ticking time bomb of rising household fragility. So you get this Keynesian validation process. Finance stimulates demand. Strong demand drives incomes. We had the great moderation. We had the early 1990s recession, and then the recession Pavlina was talking about, the brief one after the tech bubble burst in 2001. They were mild, and this is it's a partial result, probably, I don't have anything quantitative here, but largely result of this consumption debt engine. Uh, you know, consumption and housing are big quantitatively. Per, this is standard stuff, not our adjusted measures. Personal consumption expenditure, residential construction uh, could be close to three quarters of GDP since 1990, whereas business investment was less than 15% of GDP. So business investment is very volatile, no doubt about that. Keynes was right, Minsky was right. But, you know, the, in terms of aggregate demand, the consumption sector, the household sector broadly, is the, is the big piece by, by far. Uh, asset prices, uh, so you have house, housing prices rising, um, wealth effects on spending. I'm not a big wealth effects person. If you want to talk to me about housing and wealth, happy to do that. Uh, I have some non-mainstream, somewhat unusual perspectives there. But clearly there was collateral and borrowing. Uh, so while I don't think the wealth effect, the, the standard wealth effect of people saying, well, my house is worth more, and so I can spend a few percentage points of that more every year, is, was so strong, I, I clearly the rising housing prices that allowed people to borrow more was a huge factor. And you know, I had this all feeding into expectations, confidence, the, the uh, ability to refinance, the expectation that refinancing should be available on better and better terms, because that was a two, three decade process that was going on that was all part of this validation process. And then you have the rising financial fragility. The success leads to more aggressive lending and borrowing. You, I showed you the debt income ratio earlier that was kept rising, rising, rising. You definitely had this shift from short-term financing. Uh, so you, the, uh, these kind of teaser rates, the expectation you would never do this. I, I have a, a New York Times article that I use for my class about a, a and actually a financial, a financial reporter who knew, knew something about the financial system but has various health problems and a divorce and you know, is, is refinancing the house and said, well, yeah, I can pay the interest rate for two years, but I could never, I could never pay, never pay this th when, when the interest rate resets upwards, and, which was in the contract. And the, and the lender comes back, the loan officer comes back and says, oh, don't worry, you'll never pay that. You'll come back to me and refinance and we'll do it again. <laughs> well, this is the sense of speculative finance, of having to refinance uh, to make your position. And then even more borrowing to pay interest, truly Ponzi, the idea, well, the home price is rising, so I can take out more, uh, take equity out 
and then I use that to pay the mortgage. <laughs> and then when, when I run out of money, I'm going to do it again. Well, you know, this can't end well. Uh, and uh, the, the idea, uh, and this actually is, is nicely talked about in one of the papers of Randy and Eric that uh, is on the, on the reading list for the next session. You know, is this rational? Is, or you could see it as irrational, but again, remember that refinancing into low interest rate markets, falling interest rate markets with weak, or with uh, more, how much, what should I say, uh, less severe credit constraints, easier access to credit, more e easier and easier access to credit at lower and lower interest rates was a two decade plus process. So it was validating this convention in a world of uncertainty. This is the way the world was working for, for most people to, throughout much of their adult lives. Um, lending based on asset prices, not cash flow. Clearly, in this case, I mean, those examples I was giving about different kinds of loans that were out there were about the collateral value of the house, uh, not cash flows uh, at all. And that, that shows up as, as a Minsky indication of financial fragility. So here's the stress test metaphor uh, that it, you're, if, if it doesn't break, just push more, push more out there, and that's what they were doing. And ultimately, you have fragility in the crisis. Okay, so how are we in time? 11.25, I'll take a few more minutes to talk about, about inequality. So this is, a, I know, a focus here. And Derek Hamilton's uh, talk yesterday was quite uh, you know, interesting and motivating in the issue of the importance of inequality. And I want to suggest that there's a link between inequality and these Minsky and financial dynamics that I've just been describing. So we have to look beyond the aggregates here. This is just a, a chart of the uh, top 5% share uh, from the uh, piketty Sia's uh, work here. And you see it rising from about 20, a little over 20% of income to uh, around 37% by the end. So a massive rise in income inequality. Uh, well, who was doing the borrowing <laughs> during this period? So this is from a paper that uh, Barry Simmons and I did, published in the Cambridge Journal in 2015. And uh, so you have two, this is the debt income ratio uh, for different, two different groups. The, the uh, top line is the bottom 95%. The, uh, the, the heavy line, the light blue line you see, which is kind of volatile, but, but eh, maybe a slight increase depending on how you want to measure, uh, is, is the top 5%. And you know, why do we divide it 95-5 like this? Well, because we looked at this, this is from the, uh, the Survey of Consumer Finances from the Federal Reserve data. And we looked, we cut this lots of different ways. I think the first thing we did was the bottom 50%, things like that. Everybody's debt ratio was rising until we got to the top 5%. So it wasn't, this wasn't just concentrated in the, in, the lower or even necessarily the, the middle, middle part of the income distribution. And except for the very top, uh, this was, uh, the, the borrowing was very consistent, but it was clearly rising much more uh, significantly in uh, the bottom 95%. So that's kind of our story here is that it's about this shift uh, of income away from uh, almost everybody to the very top of the income distribution. This, this chart here is a little complicated. Let me take a little uh, moment to explain it. But you know, this is several years of work for this one chart. It's the key one in our, in our paper. And uh, so this is the, uh, the demand, uh, the, the, basically the, the, propensity, the average propensity to consume. Demand divided by uh, after-tax income, or consumption divided by after-tax income. Those are the solid lines. The dotted lines are outlays. Outlays would include interest expense. But they, they tell you pretty much the same story. So the, the top line, not surprisingly, the kind of brownish uh, line is uh, the bottom 95%. The bottom uh, blue line is, or it's, it's gray on the chart that you're looking at, is the top 5%. So when I first saw this chart, I thought, well, what's going on here? That top 5% looks really, I mean, screwy. And on the one hand, it, it shows what you would expect, which is the, the, the majority of, the, of American households, 95%, spend a higher share than the, than the richest 5%. That's on average. But look at all that volatility in the top 5%. I think there was a question earlier in the, in the previous session about the permanent income hypothesis. The bot, that, that blue line, or the gray, grayish line there, that is the permanent income hypothesis in action. That, uh, so when, I, when Barry generated this chart, I first said, we must have screwed this up, that's gotta be wrong, but no. I mean, what, what, what you see here is, you know, this, this uh, can I get my cursor going here? Here we go. The, this thing uh, was the 1990s recession. Um, this is the birthday of the tech bubble. This is the Great Recession. 
So what's happening is that you know, top incomes are fairly volatile, but, but the top, people at the top smooth their, their consumption, so the ratio of consumption to income rises quite dramatically in these recessions, into the point in the Great Recession where it actually exceeded uh, the, the ratio for the bottom 95%. Well, what do you see for, the, for everybody else in the economy is a, a pretty smooth ratio. If, if you look carefully, there's a bit of a positive trend from, say, you know, but not, not a huge trend. I, but for my story, it would be better if this was a little bit more upward sloping in this period. But, but they were continuing to spend, uh, if anything, a little bit higher share of their income. But looks, not much change in the recessions. But look what happens in the Great Recession. It's not what you would see as, oops, a, a dramatic downfall. But it is uh, a pretty significant. <laughs> This is the opposite of the permanent income hypothesis. You know, their incomes were falling, but they were spending a smaller share. Why? Because they couldn't borrow. So the argument here is that this rising inequality, that this, this Minskyan dynamic of borrowing to finance spending, rising household financial fragility, and then a cutback or you know, a, a reduction in the Great Recession does have an inequality dimension, that it was happening uh, outside of the richest uh, sliver of the economy, which is, let's face it, are getting a, a very large share of the income. Uh, so there's more discussion about behaviors and why this might go on in that paper that you can perceive, but you can see what's, see what's going on there. So you get this uh, collapse of the demand generation process. You get the loss of debt financed spending by the middle class, broadly conceived. 90, <laughs> so you get to the 95th percentile, it's our, it's, people will think of themselves as the middle class, even though they're, they're you know, they're, they're better off than, uh, than the vast majority of Americans. The deep recession and, and this stagnant recovery, which um, has been labeled secular stagnation. So consumption was very far from its pre-crisis trend. Uh, and I would argue that, that rising inequality is a prime suspect for why that's true. I'm going to again check my time here, better than I expected. So I'll, I'll go on a little bit more. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about this and, and again link it back to the Minsky and dynamics. So here's a little bit of data on, uh, on uh, this is kind of the way I like to think about medium run to longer run business cycles is look at look peak to peak. So you know, there's, as you've been hearing a lot about in this seminar, uh, it's very hard to define what full employment or uh, you know, would look like. Uh, any potential output is also very problematic. But what do we know? Well, we know that the economy was capable of producing what it was producing at the peaks, because it did it. Uh, whether it could have done more is another, is, a, is another story. But if we compare peak to peak, we can see what's going on. And, and you can see here that, in, uh, that, that there was a pretty dramatic uh, reduction in the, um, in the peak to peak growth rates, uh, running a little bit, this is per capita, running a little bit around uh, uh, around 2% for these first three cycles I've got there, and then uh, falling to 1.5% in the early 2000s, and only 1% in the, in the uh, period from the peak before the Great Recession until the pandemic. Uh, and, and so there's been this kind of slowdown in economic growth. Uh, this is a, maybe a more stunning thing. This is our, these are our adjusted numbers, the real household demand measures. And, and you can see here, what that dotted line is, is about as simple as it could bet. That dotted line is a geometric trend just between 2000 and 2006. And I extended it backwards. I didn't actually fit the data, but to show, you know, it, it, the, it, it, moral, it did pretty well back, into the, back to 1990. For a while, the, the, uh, the trend did, it did fall below that trend, but then it caught up by, by the late 90s and, uh, you know, the early 2000s you were following on. But then look what happens after the Great Recession. And you see the first pandemic year there as well. Um, that you just you completely fall away from from the trend before. So my argument would be the Keynesian perspective would, is that uh, the loss of real household demand because of the loss of this borrowing spending dynamic is fundamental to what has become known as secular stagnation, that slowing of the growth rate. Um, this is a similar kind of comparison that looks at uh, again this this real household demand measure. And, and indexes it to 100 at the beginning of every, of every recession. And you can see how uh, it was so much below. Uh, the, the, in, in every other recession, you, you get the recovery. They, they go on until the next downturn. Uh, you get that recovery and, and growth. But uh, you finally did get back to um, the earlier uh, level after the Great Recession, but it took 11 years. And, and so there, there's a, still a, a big gap. So. Uh, we, we link this into a simple Keynesian growth model, 
and, uh, and, and just calibrated a little bit. And so uh, this just shows some data from the calibration, which is actually taken from that, that chart you saw before about average propensities to consume and, and also tax rates, which are maybe in some ways as big of an effect as the, as the differences in and propensities to consume after tax income. And, and just kind of figured out what the change in the a growth path would look like uh, with the rise in inequality that was taking place. And, and we are, and we've, uh, you know, again, this is pretty rough and, and just a, a preliminary look at this, but that we could explain an almost 10% drop in the, growth, in the aggregate growth path as the result of this rise in inequality. Uh, and again, the, the key here is, is this Minskyan dynamic, or the, the, fin the finance dynamic, because while you can find some sympathy. I mean, Paul Krugman made this argument a while back. He said, well, I'm sympathetic to the idea that we have stagnation because of higher inequality. Um, but he said, that just doesn't fit the basic test or the ba you know, just basic logic because inequality has been rising for 30 years and we ha didn't have stagnation until after the Great Recession. But my argument would be, kind of obviously, that the, the borrowing of the middle class, of the household sector broadly conceived, in a way postponed uh, the, the effect of the rising inequality and what we've seen is it, is it hitting the U.S. economy after that borrowing process was, you know, ended, again, in a very Minskyan fashion. So uh, I'll finish up here. A few challenges going forward. Uh, obviously, the pandemic has led to real supply constraints, and so we're in an unusual period of time where some of the, the basic framework that I like to work in isn't as effective at explaining what's going on uh, as has been the case for, for really almost all of my career, certainly for the last 20 years. Uh, but I, I still would argue that we're going to have compromised demand generation going forward. Uh, uh, there's a nice uh, uh, policy brief, I think is the, is the term by, uh, by Randy and, and Yeva, uh, that's out there on the table uh, making a similar kind of argument. So, you know, we have the this deleveraging of the household sector has certainly had a strong level effect and, and actually I would argue also a growth effect. I'm studying that right now. So we have a, about a 10% gap from the previous trend we were on, which wasn't you know, such a super booming economy. The US economy in the early 2000s, between 2000 and 2006, was reasonably strong. Unemployment was low, but growth was mediocre. Uh, it wasn't like it was such a huge economy. Uh, inflation was low, interest rates were low. It was you know, kind of a jobless recovery, as you've heard, coming out of that uh, 2001 recession. Uh, so, it, but, but we're falling way behind that, uh, that trend. Uh, and there's a focus of my recent research is the way in which weak demand actually pulls the supply side down with it. Uh, let me just show you this, this chart here, which is one of my favorites. Uh, if you look at the, in the details of the US national accounts, you can find what are called vintage data. So uh, I've got you know, two, two lines here, uh, starting in 2007 and ending in 2017. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office has to make a, a, a forecast of what potential output uh, will be 10 years in advance for tax planning purposes. So that's why the time, time frame is here. So the blue line, uh, the top line, I guess it keeps looking gray in, to you, uh, is, uh, is the, uh, maybe not current, but, but uh, the, you know, year by year uh, forecast of the output gap. And you see, well, it dropped dramatically to about 6% uh, after the Great Recession, in the Great Recession, and then recovered very slowly, so that by 2017, they actually said the economy was operating slightly above so-called potential output. What is the red line? The red line is the gap if you measured the potential, using the potential output forecast in 2007. <laughs> Uh, without without changing it, and you see you never recover. Uh, you know you drop you drop uh, initially in the recession to about nine percent, but then actually it, it goes down even more. And you know recognize that the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, making these forecasts, they understand that you know Steve Fazari's generation, the baby boomers, they're getting old. Uh, they know this. They're smart people. They're all the demographics are taken into account in that forecast, but the economy is still you know underperforming dramatically as a result of this period. So. This idea that this kind of stagnant demand and the absence of the financial stimulus of the borrowing of the household sector, uh, you know, I, I, we'll see where we go after this kind of pandemic disruption works itself out. Uh, but my guess is we're gonna see, uh, we're, we're gonna see some fairly weak uh, periods unless we change policy fairly dramatically. Um, I will also note that when the Minsky theory applied to business firms, 
talks about the crisis as a cleansing process. Uh, it, it wipes out the weak financial positions. Uh, the, the fragility that's built up in the, in the upswing is hit by the crisis. You know, and, and firms go bankrupt, businesses go out. Households don't go away in some respects. I think that's a difference in, 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 in different ways. And so uh, the, the, the weaker household demand that we have uh, as a result of pulling out the, the borrowing stimulus and the rise in inequality, I think is gonna be with us uh, as we go forward. So this is my final slide. Um, it's uh, back to Minsky, uh, and I would say, you know, he had the right insights, or his, his problem provides the right insights once again. So he did have this rather passive uh, uh, concept of consumption, which is understandable given the historical framework in which his ideas evolved, but the framework he developed in the financial instability hypothesis provides a central insight and in that it helps us understand the way in which household finance is critical to US, um, the, this US experience. And then I wanna finish with this historical specificity point. Uh, so you know, various people, even some, some of my own papers over the years have tried to write down a Minsky model in, in more formal terms uh, using uh, mathematical modeling and things, and, and I think that's been useful and insights have come from it. Uh, but I, I, at the end, I, I find it often uh, uh, unsatisfying. Uh, and and bec because the financial instability hypothesis is a framework for thinking about actual historical events. And the way in which those, those events evolve uh, is, is, a, is gonna be different across each cycle. So, you know, Minsky would talk about these various th things about, as I mentioned, uh, commercial paper, Penn Central Railroad, uh, oil patch lending in the early 1980s, all these different kinds of uh, historical experiences. And then we have this big one that I've been talking about, which was the, you know, the household, uh, the household borrowing, uh, house price bubble, uh, you know, of a multi-decade process leading to the, <laughs> leading to the Great Recession. Thank you, that's good. <laughs> Probably an indication I should be on my last slide, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, and it, that, is, so in some respects, I think it's useful to use the tools of history. It really was Minsky's own method, as you read through his work, uh, where he describes these various events uh, as more of a, the way of a historian would use that to, to uh, explore the theory. And so the, fam but the, the, the key here is this family resemblance across cycles. While the details are gonna be different, uh, the, they have this validation fragility dynamic that I think is, is central to the Minsky idea. So, uh, he, he, you know, my <laughs> friend, teacher, mentor, colleague, Hyman Minsky uh, has, um, has given us a lot. Uh, this is my introduction to Minsky, so to speak. Your application of Minsky to some pretty important uh, macro dynamics of the US economy, uh, linkages to rise of inequality. And I actually did better than I thought. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes for questions. So I will stop here. Thank you. Mm. I'll, I'll do my best. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah, so my question is about, um, one, uh, to what extent policy makers understand this, uh, whether they're in the Fed or writing law or anything, and two, um, or financial regulation, and, uh, and two, is there, so like, uh, often in MMT, the sectoral balances approach comes up, um, and in, in that sort of main thing that's pointed to is the private sector deficit, right, the increase in debt, I guess, debt minus assets, financial assets. Um, is that sort of a good measure, slash what other measures of financial fragility do you, like, do you think that policy makers should look at to determine where we are in the fragility cycle? Okay, so those are good questions. I, I think the, you know, do policy makers actually perceive this process? Broadly, I would say no. I think there was a, I, I think there was a, a recognition of the importance of, of finance broadly. So no is a little bit too strong. But you know, if it's on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is they fully get it and, and one is they have no idea, I'd say three or four would be the best place. So, and that's moved from about 0 0.5. <laughs> so, so, you know, before the Great Recession, you know, great moderation, we've got everything, uh, everything figured out. In, in a book that some of the uh, uh, people here have contributed to that I, I edited um, on the Great Recession a few years afterwards, uh, we start in the introduction with a quote from Bernanke in, uh, 
I think it's March or April of 2008. So now the recession's already begun, officially began in December of 2007, but way, be but not way before, but before the real, you know, falling off the cliff in late 2008. And Bernanke says, yeah, we might be in a bit of a recession, we don't know for sure, but looking at the data, it could be, but well, everything will be fine by the fall. <laughs> And you know, clearly it didn't, it, it didn't play out. And you know, he kind of had to say that under the circumstances. Maybe he was more worried, but this was his public, his public perception. Um, th there was a general sense that in this great moderation that, that in you know, wise monetary policy was going to take care of us. We could focus fiscal policy on sound finance, as Pavlina was talking about in the earlier session. After the Great Recession, you have more recognition. The financial sector really can upset the cart here, and uh, the, the zero lower bound and these kinds of issues. So there was a focus, and you have you know, everybody with their DSGE models trying to integrate various financial frictions into those models. So there's that kind of sense of moving there. But the broader, the broader issue about seeing the systemic nature of financial instability, the, the validation fragility dance that I've been talking about, I don't, you know, I don't think is really part of policy. These things are viewed as, as, as kind of idiosyncratic. You know, we shouldn't have given all that money to Southeast Asian countries, uh, you know, that was crony capitalism, we're not gonna do that again. You know, we shouldn't have, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't have had crazy securitization in the housing market, we're not gonna do that again, we fixed that problem. And not seeing the, that kind of family resemblance. Your second question, you have to remind uh, me of. About sort of measurement of. Oh, measurement, yeah, the household deficit, things like that. I, I'd have to go back and think. I thought about that some. It's not, uh, the, you know, the balance, the sectoral balance approach is, is quite, is quite uh, uh, useful. I would be inclined, uh, I don't know, we've got Brandy here, and well, when Godley would say, I, I would be inclined to, uh, to take the private sector and separate that out between the household sector and business in some respects, because I think the dynamics could be somewhat different. But broadly speaking, I think it's a, that's a helpful approach and policy should look there. I think you were there, and then that's what, yeah. So uh, I wonder, what is your point of view when you think about enemy superpositions to use the debt as a tool to maintain income and prosperity and the free climate? Uh, when you think about this proposition in a Minsky fragile, uh, instability, financial stability, because, I don't know, maybe, uh, if, you, if, you, if you use the government to maintain the income, property, and uh, free climate, the, markets, the financial markets start to be more risky about it. Yeah. So it's kind of a paradox, like you try to save the economy, stabilize the economy, but at the same time, using this, the financial markets can see it as um, a safety tool yeah. to be more risky. So this kind of paradox, how do you see this? You can have this MMT propositions to free employment, uh, property, and income, and at the same time have this instability, financial stability paradox, I guess. I don't know. Right, so that's a great point, and, and widely recognized by Minsky himself, among others. I think Bob Pollan, uh, some years ago, wrote a paper where he literally called it the Minsky paradox, which is, in a crisis, you have big bank, big government, you know, big deficits to help sustain profits, big bank is lender of last resort, uh, which is necessary to provide stability, but the result is you rather, you validate, you, you actually add to the validation. You say, oh, okay, that was not so bad. Was, you, know, the, we, you may have heard this phrase, the Greenspan put, or the Fed put, the idea that, uh, that the Fed would be, would be you know, always kind of contain the, the financial instability, which then encourages, in, encourages more risky behavior. So uh, Minsky recognized it. Um, it's kind of a nuanced, appro a nuanced approach. I think it's correct. Uh, again, I'd, I'd, I'd refer more to the, to the experts of MMT that you've been hearing about than myself. But my, my perspective on this would be, we might be able to think about this differently in the sense of, uh, and I think this is ties into what Pavlina was saying earlier this morning about functional finance, which is less about kind of stabilizing the private sector and, and, and more kind of fundamental interventionist <laughs> Uh, perspective on, on providing a kind of macroeconomic stability, policies for macroeconomic stability that, that aren't about, you know, kind of validating these things. So something like the job guarantee would be an example of that, whereas it does that, in a sense, maybe it would actually encourage more, to the extent it stabilizes the economy, it might encourage more, more risky behavior. It's not clear you can get out of this paradox. And I think that's part of the problem with Minsky. People don't like that story. They, they, they want the, the, here's the right solution. This is gonna fix us, end of story. Whereas this is more like, well, we can take this up, but there might be some consequences later. I think there was a question back here, and I will come around, yeah. 
prices endlessly on the expectation that they think interest rates are always going to be at zero. And would, would that not lead to instability? Um, and, or, and if it doesn't lead to instability, it leads to huge inequality because asset prices seem to have no limit. Yeah, uh, the, uh, a present value calculation with a zero denominator is, is difficult. <laughs> Uh, so so I, 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 share that, I share that view to, to, to some extent. My own, I, I can't comment for Minsky. I, you know, I was t tasked to give this lecture for years. They keep inviting me back, so I guess they want me. Uh, but the, uh, uh, I don't really consider myself a detailed Minsky scholar, as other people in the room are who have really read the work in more detail. So uh, in, in that sense, I'm going to defer a little bit about what Minsky would think. Uh, I, I think a low and stable interest rate makes, makes sense. And, and in particular, I am skeptical about... Uh, the new consensus view that monetary policy is our kind of macroeconomic savior and can always be assured to get the economy back to something like a full employment so-called potential output path unless we hit the zero lower bound. <laughs> and so actually my research going forward is going to be focused particularly on that issue uh, in, in that sense. And so, uh, in fact, these kind of wide swings in, in, in interest rates that we saw prior to the Great Recession. So I think the, the Fed funds rate was in the neighborhood of of 6% sum in the late, in like 2000, and it drops down to 1%. Then it goes up to 5.25% and, and drops down to zero for a decade. And, and so that those, are, th those kinds of swings are not helpful to stabilizing an economy. And ultimately, not nearly as powerful as the new consensus model suggests they are. So I would find myself in favor of a low interest rate policy, uh, Probably, maybe zero in, in, in real terms, uh, prob probably not zero in nominal terms, but I think that, that, that could be debated. Now I'm kind of lost track of where the, hey, let's go here. <laughs> um, so I have, I have two questions. One is, so your explanation of circular stagnation focuses on a lack of effective demand. Yes. Um, but you also point out how the demand that we saw before was, I'm thinking in like Keynesian terms where he says, as output grows, people save more and more, and so investment demand has to catch up. But what we're seeing is people actually save less, even this save, and that is what drove demand. So my question is sort of like, what do you say to more supply side explanations of secular stagnation that say we just haven't seen the sort of great like investment that would you know bring us to like a huge major technological innovation that would actually drive productivity, and that that is sort of the basis, and that maybe like the debt finance like output growth we've seen is was just postponing that. And then the second question is, we heard a um, great presentation from uh, Professor Kelton, and she was pointing out how financial, uh, how um, real economic crises were triggered, um, maybe not caused, but triggered by a few years before of government running a, a, a surplus. And you know the private sector, including businesses, being in a deficit position, and how that like, consistently occurred before a crisis. So how do you match that to your sort of Minskyan explanation? Great, great, great questions. I, I wish I had another lecture to answer them. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there, there's, so, there's so much going on there. Um, now I have to re reset and make sure I've got the right perspective. Remind me again, just what are the two points? Quick. <laughs> supply side. Supply side and then, OK, so we'll just start with supply side. <laughs> so th this is tied to uh, actually the work that I'm doing these days. Uh, I, I think there's a. There, there's a really evidence for strong hysteresis effects. So broadly speaking, this, this chart here, it's right there in the end so I can go to it, this one here suggests a kind of hysteresis effect, uh, which is that weak, you know, a weak economy is gonna lead to uh, uh, lower growth in productivity, lower growth in labor force, and things along those lines. And actually working on a paper right now with a graduate student at WashU on, uh, on estimating these things. I have a theoretical paper in the Cambridge Journal with some calibration that, that argues that this happens. And so the demand side leads to supply side. So it's the opposite in some respects. Uh, now, if from a Minskyan perspective, if your demand is being generated in an unsustainable way, it might actually kind of stimulate the supply side too, but, but then, you, then you lose it and you get this instability. So I think that leads into your second question about, about uh, kind of policy in some respects is where you go. So I, I think it's very important to consider the supply side. I think you have, to, you, you have to think about it, but you can't ignore the demand side. So the problem with mainstream thinking over the decades has been that if there are demand problems at all, if we, if we think of them as short run, and the, you know, the kind of mainstream use of the term structural, they'd say, well, but in the long run, we have to look at structural issues, which is only focused on the supply side, as if the demand side is going to take care of itself. 
and and I you know I don't don't think that's true. Uh, so if we think about the, the, the your point you brought up about Stephanie Kelton's discussion about government surpluses, yeah, I, I, it, again, <laughs> linking to my current research, I have you know two thirds of a paper written on fiscal policy and a Keynesian growth model where. And this is, if you're familiar, some of you with the super multiplier work and autonomous demand and things like this, you have to look at that. You have to look at those issues. It is not, it may not be feasible to have strong growth, strong employment with a, a, a contracting government sector as a, as, a, as a share of the economy. So when the government's running a surplus, it's, it's, a, it's a huge drag and I think leading to crisis. So linking in fiscal policy to uh, a demand-led growth perspective strikes me as being, being critical. Uh, I think we, you've been had your hand up for a while. Go ahead, please. Well, first I want to thank the organizers for editing my cameo appearance out of the video. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I have, uh, it seems like uh, determining when fragility is only possible, determining when fragility happens is only possible in retrospect, in uh, hindsight. It's like kind of, you know, when is someone, when does someone that drinks become drunk? It's like, you know, it's a, it's a decision. It's a, it, and I, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that. And then the other concept is um, regarding inequality, uh, the validation of riskier behavior seems somewhat related to the class conflict theory of inflation, of pushing costs onto others, of hot potato, of, you know, I can profit, but some other sucker is gonna, to you know, suffer these consequences. Um, just those two concepts. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, somehow my brain is like, when well, I got the second one, uh, you'll have to. Come, what was the first one again? Sorry. Um, deter when when does fragility oh fragility? Yeah, how do we how do we see it? And that you can only see it in retrospect. Well, you know, this was again kind of a mainstream sense. Uh, was the famous the famous uh, letter from the Queen to the to the British economists about why did none, why, why did you see this great recession coming, this financial crisis coming? It's, oh, no, nobody did. It, we, it, we, it was not in our models. But that, you know, that, that is true of some people in this room. Uh, so I'll, I'll give my own kind of personal plug, but I wasn't by, by far the first. So I, had a, uh, I was working with Barry Sinema on an op-ed saying this next recession could be pretty nasty because of the household sector. Uh, and it was, it was actually finally after trying to market it to the top journalistic places, we, it, it came out in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which is a perfectly fine paper, but uh, not the New York Times or the Washington Post. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it, it was probably in there around... Uh, Late 2007, uh, fall of 2007, saying that we, we could see this coming. Randy, I know you've, you know, you were writing about this. You say, and actually, you say, Minsky actually saw it coming himself in, you know, in the in the 1990s, uh, in many respects. Uh, uh, so there have been a number uh, people that were looking from this framework. You know, could see that. I will say this for myself. I can only speak for myself here. I was actually surprised that we didn't see a, a worse crisis in after the tech bubble burst. Uh, you could already see the household debt problem. I thought that was going to spill over more to the consumer sector. But if you go back and look at my charts, you can see it, the consumer sector is powered right the heck through it. And we actually got the, you know, the most extreme part of the housing bubble in that period from, from the 2001 recession up until 2006, 2007. So the timing is really an issue in, in some respects. I, don't, you know, I think that's, that, I don't know who would be able to say, when fragility hits the point that leads to the crisis. But the idea that it could come, I think, you know, was, was in some sense out there. Your, your, uh, your analogy to a drunk is, is pretty good, right? If we understand the theory of drunkenness, if somebody's sitting there sucking down one beer after another, uh, <laughs> even though you don't, they might seem reasonably coherent, you can kind of see where it's going. So and, but you, but, but you, so far, so good. Yeah, <laughs> but, you, you know, but you have to have the right theory in some respects. If you think, oh, that's just like a glass of water, you're not going to get it right. Uh, and was, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the class conflict theory of inflation is linked to the... Is, uh, I can push my costs off, but it, it, uh, validation. So I, I, can yeah. this, I can benefit, some other sucker's going to suffer. Right, right. So, uh, so I, I do think there is the kind of greater fool theory aspect of that validation process. If, and I'm not sure I'm quite following where you're going, but that... Uh, that you know, you, there were probably people who thought, yes, this is kind of nuts. What was happening in the housing sector? Actually, like validation that not just that it's, things are okay, but that I can get away with it. I can get away with it, yes, yes. That things may not be okay, but I'll, but I'll get out before you will. Uh, and, that, uh, and, and actually, I think that is a, that's an indication of fragility. <laughs> you know, if you've got this kind of hair trigger sense of, you know, I, 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 okay, if you, think this, if you think an asset is overvalued, but you think its price is gonna to rise tomorrow, it makes sense to hold the asset. Uh, 
But as soon as you, if that's the general perception, or if there's a lot of that perception, then uh, what might be a, a small shock in a more, in a less fragile uh, time could lead to a, to a, a kind of a, a crisis very quickly. How are we doing on time? Just a couple more. Yeah, anybody on this side have been kind of right-hand biased? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, interesting technical question. Uh, so, uh, in terms of kind of cumulative collapse processes, uh, I think the autonomous demand issue is an important one, which I don't know if it's in Minsky. Lots of things are in Minsky. Uh, but but the, the link there, I, a 2013 paper I, I published with it actually shows that some amount of autonomous demand, any, any amount of autonomous demand will, will kind of turn a, a collapsing cycle at the bottom uh, because it rises as a share as, as, as income goes down. So there's some kind of technical responses to that. But I'm not, again, I, I don't want to be overly technical in that sense. Uh, I, I mean, there, there, for example, I mean, uh, was it Laval and Sekarica had written this paper saying, well, you know, the Minskyan story may not be quite right about rising leverage in some sense, because income is rising at the same time, debt's rising. Could you have some kind of steady state where, where uh, there's enough of an increase in income to, to offset the increase in debt. Actually, on, on my fiscal policy paper, it's exactly what happens with, with government debt, that you get, if you have government spending growing faster, you actually lower the debt to GDP ratio, but that's a different kind of story. I, I, my, my response here on the, on the, is more of an empirical one, saying it didn't happen. <laughs> so uh, you know, we, we could kind of work through what models might tell us formally, but if you, look at, if you look at this process in particular, the household debt process I'm emphasizing, there was a massive rise in leverage. Uh, and uh, that wasn't entirely your point, but it is the issue about how, you know, the evidence and the, and the models kind of have to work together in some respects. One more? Go ahead, please. Uh, are there some indicators to, to see the transition of the Minsky uh, uh, characteristics of the hedge policy uh, and so on and so forth? Do you use some indicators, or there are some indicators that are constructed? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting, interesting point. I, I like the head speculative Ponzi kind of concept, and a lot of people have talked along those lines. Um, and I have not actually, in my own work, uh, used that extensively as trying to define those, those things specifically. And, and uh, you know, to be, again, this is a speaking for myself, uh, while th that's qualitatively interesting, it's kind of fun to talk about it in some respects, and you see these aspects, the examples I gave were more anecdotal accounts along these lines, and I think that's useful. It's along this kind of historical method of seeing what's happening. Uh, it's, it's hard to define these things uh, formally. The, the work I know most on this, I guess, is Lila Davis, uh, and she has looked at microdata and, and did this quite explicitly, and did not find a lot of, in the business sector, a lot of hedge speculative to Ponzi you know, kind of, kind of, you know, movements in some respects. And I think that, you know, that has to be taken seriously in some, in some ways. <sighs> to me, the household, the, the, the example I talked about, the household sector is the best example in the last, in, in probably at least the U.S. context, the post-war decades of the, of the Minsky process. The other ones that he talked about were more, tended to be more, more focused. Like I mentioned, the Penn Central Railroad and commercial paper and the borrowing against oil, you know, oil in the, in the in oil production in the, in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, what was I saying? The, with the Asian flu, the Southeast Asian lending, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, what's happening in Latin American lending, other kinds of things like that, that were, you know, that, that were linked in these forms, but they didn't, they didn't, that those kinds of things didn't focus so much on micro level hedge speculative Ponzi kind of evolution. So I, I, another other questions. Uh, I have to check in for my flight tomorrow, uh, which which I will do quickly. But you know, can hang around here. I'll join you lunch. I'll be around. So uh, let's uh, let's end on time. And thanks for your good questions. And great to be here. <laughs>